So, what can I tell you? Um, let's start with a very simple statement. Every company, every organization has a mission statement. They're mostly boring, um, nobody ever reads them, and we tend to ignore them. This university's mission statement is the shortest I've ever seen. It's quite simple. The purpose of Cambridge University for the last 150 years is to serve society through research, teaching and learning to the highest international standards of excellence. That's it. No ifs, buts, ands or maybes. That's what Cambridge does. The bit I want to pick on is what does it mean to serve society? For this reason, we believe that the opportunities in the biotech sector, the nature of interface with the commercial, the private, the, uh, as well as the public sectors, is absolutely key. We need all those elements because the problems we have to tackle in order to effectively serve society are actually practical, real, and social, in as much as we have to help communities very often from far poorer parts of the world. There is a problem with the global top universities. They can be very self-seeking. Wherever I speak to them, uh, many of the presidents, particularly of the North American universities, obsess about how much money they've raised for their institution. But ultimately, there has to be another challenge. And that challenge is, goes back to that speech from John Kennedy, which basically, you remember, said, don't ask what America can do for you, ask what you can do for America. And academics in this area will have to ask the question of what we as an institution should be doing in sectors that are far worse off than we are. And therefore, in serving society, we have to be appropriate and responsive to needs in poorer parts of the world as much as being responsive to the needs of future academics here in Cambridge. This whole situation is made much more difficult because of the problems that we face that the big challenges that we have in the biotech world and in global health themselves can never be considered in isolation. In introducing the uh, conference, you mentioned Gandhi. I actually have a bust of Gandhi in my office. It's the one that I didn't move. It's the one that I actually do have there. And it's to remind me of two things. I fundamentally and totally disagree with Gandhi on education. You do not improve the state of India's education by going back to villages and learning through spinning or through other crafts. You, in today's world, you have to drive education at a far more technologically uh, overt way. But he recognized something that was really important in the Indian context, and that is the nature of the unit in which India, in the main, is going to have to operate, and much of the developing world operates. And that's the rural community of the village. And it epitomizes the linkages that we actually have between the big global challenges. Because we all in this room are going to be thinking of biotech and health in isolation. The truth is, if you look at a village economy, it's a triad. Health, productivity, and education are so inextricably linked, you cannot affect any one of those three without affecting the other two. If you are ill in a village community, you will pull your kids out of school in order that they till the fields to maintain productivity. If productivity falls and your income falls, you will again pull your kids out of school to try to increase productivity, but ill health might supervene. At the same time, if you have no education, and that is certainly true in the field of cervical cancer, you do not even have awareness of a disorder because you un do not have the concepts by which you can actually improve your health. So please don't run away with the idea that we can just solve all of these problems by a focus on biotechnology. Remember all the time the in inextricable 
interlinkage between these phenomena. So this convergence adds a huge challenge and a huge dimension to the challenge that we face. But it's a challenge we actually have to step up to. Now we will, in this room, mostly be focusing through the next two days on biotechnology and how that area can really make a difference. And at Cambridge, yes, we do have a very strong focus in that domain. But it's always done in the context of remembering that broader picture that we have to engage with. So what is it that we try and do here uh, at Cambridge? This is a very strange place. I've learned that over the last three and a half years. Um, in fact, I've been heard to describe it as the last commune in the world. This is a commune of academics. It is not led by directors coming in from outside. It is led by the academics in this institution. Believe me, as Vice Chancellor, there are moments I wish it wasn't, but in the main, I'm very supportive of the fact that it is a very democratic and egalitarian body. And as such, it is, has all the strengths and the weaknesses of an organization which is absolutely bottom up in where it, it starts. We start off with individual investigators who are appointed here largely because of their research achievements. The fact is, many of them become superb teachers as well, but that isn't the, the primacy when they're actually appointed. We're honest enough to admit that. They engage in research that they wish to pursue. We believe that is a fundamental strength. And thankfully, in the United Kingdom, the continuation of support for bottom-up science is still there. It's always threatened with being eroded, but it is still there. So we encourage academics to develop their own interests. Where we create major strategic themes, those themes are not created in this institution top down. We actually have a setting whereby we throw open to the academic community, you decide which themes we're going to, uh, to deal with, but remember once you've decided, we expect you to actually stick to that decision. And that's how our strategic themes in the university are identified. The top-down nature makes things easy, but it does cause problems. And the problem here is, can a committee ever decide anything in terms of the future of research? The problems of committees is they're very good at the status quo. They're very good at ensuring that incremental science continues. But the biggest problem with the large grand committee that will decide on all the themes is that we'll very often miss the paradigm shift that we all search for in research because that is going to come out of left center. It isn't necessarily going to come out of mainline science. And we have to leave that opportunity open. And all of the good thinking areas that we do have, and I certainly experienced them at the MRC, Cancer Research UK, and the Wellcome Trust, leave this major possibility wide open so that we remain receptive to the new idea, even though by peer review it's sometimes very difficult to spot it. And for that reason, because of this bottom-up nature, we have allowed a development in Cambridge which is widely called the Cambridge Phenomenon to take place. Now, like all vice-chancellors, I have a job to portray Cambridge um, and as the success story that I fundamentally believe it is. And I have to do that to people like the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now, politicians have a very short time frame in which they can actually operate and respond, and their ability to retain facts is somewhat limited. <laughs> so the uh, advertisement runs as follows for Cambridge. Did you know, Chancellor, what Cambridge has actually achieved through the Cambridge phenomenon. 1,600 companies over 50 years, 58,000 jobs for a population of 600,000 people, and to your exchequer, last year, Chancellor, it brought in 13.4 billion sterling. Oh, you wanted a comparison. Rolls-Royce brought in 12 billion last year. Therefore, it follows, Chancellor, that Cambridge is more important to the UK economy than Rolls-Royce. Would you ponder that next time you support uh, Rolls-Royce in, in this area? And it's to give that sense of scale and achievement that's there. 
Now, why has that been achieved? Because the university doesn't drive this. The university is a partner with so many other bodies that have come in into this region to allow us to develop new activities. Firstly, we support it because it goes to the heart of serving society. This enables us to have discoveries that are made in the university be made quickly available. But it comes with two caveats. We mustn't become overbearing in ownership of intellectual property, and we must make sure that the primacy is to get it out there rather than to worry about the pounds and pence. Those of you who might want to be assiduous leaders, readers of accounts might look at the Cambridge accounts. You will not find a single penny associated with income from intellectual property owned by the university because we want it out there as quickly as possible, encouraging young investigators who actually have that opportunity and that desire to become entrepreneurial to make it as easy as possible for them uh, to take those ideas forward. Does it always work? No. There are difficult times, there are difficult negotiations, but by and large, that's the principle on which, as a university, we want to engage with, because it serves society. So that area is one that is really to, uh, goes to the heart of, of, of where we are. And we believe the second way we serve society best is by no compromise on excellence. Here, I'm going on from this meeting to a conference with the Department for Education in, in London. It does set us up with some criticism. We will not veer from the absolute requirement for academic excellence for entrance to this university. We agree with widening participation. We agree with all of the statements to make the university as accessible. But yes, we do discriminate, and we discriminate unashamedly on academic excellence from all students who come to this institution. And certainly during my time here, there will be no veering from that particular stance. Because it is through excellence that we can actually ensure that we create a community of scholars that will always be challenging the cutting edge of wherever science takes us, and therefore, again, better able to serve society through the discoveries and through their work uh, in, in the forefront. I could give you example after example of what has been achieved. But there is a further part to this phenomenon that happens because, as a university, we do not try to dominate the position uh, either of the city or of the development of the community around us. And that is that others join us. When I talked to the chief executive of AstraZeneca and asked him why did they choose Cambridge as their global headquarters for the future, the main answer that I got was because there is a culture which is open inherently, it engages with success, and it allows others to thrive in that community. It doesn't become the overbearing community or the overbearing owner of activity trying to make that sense of ownership being the, the primacy of where the university stands. There are some of you who will look at it and say, well, that doesn't always happen. That's true, because there are always uh, debates and discussions in this area. But I would say that we have that uh, strength that's there. Because of the bottom-up nature, multidisciplinarity is inherent in what Cambridge does. We, don't, we talk about the individual and individual projects, but we now also talk about the strategic themes in the sector, of biotechnology, public health, cancer, stem cells, cardiovascular disease, immunology and infectious diseases are probably areas where we would claim some primacy in those particular domains. Brought up, bottom up, by coming together. There's a second rule with our strategic themes. We will support them and ensure that they can continue to be supported into the future but it requires participation of three of the six schools of the university so that arts and humanities are brought into every one of our strategic themes. We do not discriminate and make them pure physical sciences or pure biomedical sciences. And that, again, adds to that theme of serving society. 
So I believe we build institutional relationships with industry particularly well. We make a range of resources available. And therefore, I believe that through this, we contribute more effectively to the grand challenges that we face. We're not going to solve all of them because I'm of the belief that no single academic institution, even maybe our sister institution in, in the other Cambridge, no matter how powerful it might seem itself, see itself as being, could actually solve the problem of food security. So external collaboration comes to the forefront, and we are wide open to those interactions to ensure that those interactions can be brought forward. And global health will require the collaboration of all types of bodies, commercial, academic, governmental, public health, and even international organizations, let alone to say the philanthropic, the funding sector, and those charities that are driving some of these agendas. So these are international problems that need international solutions. And of course, as Vice Chancellor here, I'm going to claim that one of the things we have to do is to ensure that drive continues from this institution. Therefore, to top all of this, we also have groupings that focus on policy. Because it is our responsibility to ensure that the evidence that's collected is actually made available to those who are more interested in the policy dimensions than merely the outcomes of what we do. And last but not least, it has to be adaptable and affordable to those less off, better off than we are in this country. I'm just going to finish with a statement that I made at a lecture I gave in Monash University. And it goes back to that challenge of the so-called internationally leading universities. Ponder what we as international universities should be doing together to those parts of the world by giving away some of our influence and engaging with those institutions in countries where maybe tertiary education, the opportunities for people in those countries to develop their own ideas are not so well developed. In fact, in some countries, they face extreme opposition to being able to take those ideas forward. And as a body, the internationally leading universities should be there supporting tertiary education. No matter how poor a country is, tertiary education is absolutely vital. If they can participate in this process of innovation and development. And remember, in the global biotech, much of the development is going to be in the so-called south rather than in the north. The question is, let's listen to the agendas that they need and they need us to engage with because it is only then that global biotechnology will be truly global and only then will this university be a truly global university by this shared participation and engagement. So I'm going to stop there and I'd like you to think of what does it mean, that word global, in your title today, to make it relevant and to make sure that your discoveries in biotechnology and the way you drive them can be accessible to those who are still living on a dollar a day at the end of the day, even though hopefully with the new development goals, we might see an end of that by 2025. But there are a lot of poor people out there who need access to technologies. So carry on your strong work, make sure you do it, but make it affordable and relevant to the problems that the world truly faces. Thank you.